Hello. In this lecture, I'm talking about an extraordinary project, Project Gardener. With Gardener, we are revolutionizing the way we deploy, manage, and run software at SAP. It allows us to manage thousands of Kubernetes clusters across all major YAS environments and in private data centers. My name is Dirk Mawinski, and I'm a software architect and software engineer working on the Gardener project. And I'm also one of the initiators and developers on the Garden Linux project, which I will cover later on. As a very early member of the Gardener team, I had the privilege as part of an excellent team to build the team and to shape Gardener into what it is today. I'm also helping the SAP organization uh, to change and optimize the way they deploy and run their software on Kubernetes. Change, this is what the presentation is about, and that's a change that you will also see in your IT. At SAP, we are very actively using Kubernetes, and most of that is actually on Gardner. And we have an architectural guidance internally that demands that users go for Gardner and not for another Kubernetes implementation. So with Gardner, we're managing more than 3,000 production clusters across the globe in more than 60 regions on all major YAS providers and also in private data centers and running services for the intelligent enterprise. So if you're using an SAP cloud service today, it's actually very likely that one of those services is running on a Kubernetes cluster managed by Gardner. Um, for all that Kubernetes clusters, we are operating that very efficiently with a team of five. And Gardner is 100% open source. So everything to run Gardner is on GitHub. And this is what Gardner is all about. Okay, coming to the agenda. Um, I will start with an introduction on cloud native containers and Kubernetes and explain why that approach is so revolutionary and why it's changing on how we run software today. I will then go into a deep dive with Gardner, explain how it works, and then present three projects that we're running as part of the Gardner project, which is Gardner on Metal, Garden Linux, and Gardner for Private Cloud. And I will close with, with a short, short summary and takeaways. Okay, so now let me explain for a couple of minutes on the, the foundations of what we do. So let me start with a historical outline. Unfortunately, I can't go back much further. So I started my professional career with mainframes and coming from mainframes to three tier was already a big change. So three tier applications are basically made out of a database, an application server and the UI for corporate environments with thousands or even a hundred thousand uh, concurrent users. Um, an innovation that kicked in in the early 2000s was virtualization and YAS, which optimized and revolutionized the way we run 3 tier applications. And by today, um, most of the 3 tier applications are actually running in virtualized and not in bare metal environments anymore. Um, the next step was services and modularization to cut the services into kind of interfaces and make sure they, they interoperate. The big change that we're seeing today is with microservices by really cutting up those services and making them independent of each other. So that means we're not running a single application server with everything, um, but we are running them as independent business components that communicate with, with each other. Um, in contrast to like 100,000 concurrent users that we have in corporate environments. Uh, we are now, managed, or now offering services to the whole world. So we have millions or even up to hundreds of millions of concurrent users. Um, so everybody has a smartphone today and is always online. And we have myriads of IoT devices that are always online and talking to some backend components. So even I came along an article talking about espresso makers, talking to some IoT servers. Okay, so what's making up um, those 
uh, microservices applications. So first of all, we have scalable stateless apps or 12-factor apps, and they're stateless. So that means if you have a higher load, you can just add application server instances, and you can remove them if your load decreases. Uh, a very interesting development here are Lambda functions, um, which is basically you call functions and you pay per function call. So you don't need to worry about servers and you pay what you use. And those can scale. So if there's high load, for example, during lunchtime, it scales out. And if there's no load, for example, during night, it scales in. Okay, so then we need persistency. Um, so basically, we're moving into the area of distributed, resilient, stateful apps. So we have at SAP, we have SAP Data Hub, but there is a number of products out there on the market. So now we have hundreds of microservices with maybe thousands of instances, and we have a distributed data store. And that's going to be really hard to manage because things go wrong in that environment. And that's why we need a service mesh or circuit breaker. So if something goes wrong, and like if we have loaded applications, then probably something will go wrong all the time. So you need to make sure that um, broken components are isolated and not used anymore and restarted. So as you can imagine, you have thousands of instances of microservices, so you need a way to run them. And the way to run them is using containerization. So containerization is not an entirely new concept. So it started with um, BSD in the late 70s, but only Docker made that enterprise ready in, in roughly 2013. So this is what we call cloud native. And some of the properties that we attribute to this are here. And I want to focus from DevOps to NoOps. So today you do DevOps, you, you invest. But what we try to do with Gardner and with our application is go into a NoOps model um, where basically software operates software. And actually we've gone pretty well with that with Gardner. So as I said, we have five people managing more than 3,000 clusters. And even if we move to more clusters, we don't expect that team to grow. So let's move into container. So basically a software, a software materializes in operating system processes. That process consumes some CPU and memory. It requires an executable and that executable may depend on libraries. Um, and that all is running in an environment. So it's a file system, it's a host name, uh, and it's networking. So it needs to talk to the outside or serve applications on the network. Uh, what's also needed is some configuration. So in different environments, for example, you might connect to different databases. Um, separate, we need secrets, and we don't want to mix secrets with configuration. And for stateful application, you need storage. So all of that is a container. And it's actually implemented by the operating system using means such as control groups, namespaces, and security profiles. Keep in mind that's still only a process. So you're also able to use native means from the host uh, in that process. So for example, if you have machine learning workloads, you can just use GPU resources that are available on the host. So everything is software and the building block is the process. Okay, so let's look a bit more into containers. So what Docker introduced was a container registry. So that means I take a container the image, like the executable and everything what it needs, and put it into a registry. So the most well-known is certainly Docker Hub, but like all the providers have that at the moment, and there are lots of implementations also for on-premise. So if I start the process, um, that image is downloaded from the registry to the host. It's instantiated. Um, configuration is added, secrets are added, and storage volume is added. 
And then the process is instantiated using CPU and memory. So what are the, the, the properties? So um, first of all, the operating system can be minimized. So it doesn't need any software, it just needs the kernel and a container runtime because all software is actually installed via containers. Um, the times of the DLL hell are over because the, the um, executable brings all its dependencies, like whether it's like Python 2.7 or 3.7, it's all in the container. Um, the packaging is minimal. Um, that is uh, more for security reasons. And really, you shouldn't have more packages in your container or on your operating system because a component that has security vulnerabilities best not included in your container, especially if you don't use it. Um, processes are isolated in containers, so they don't see each other. Isolation today might not be as good as with virtualization, but with some interesting projects, we're getting there. It's 100% reproducible. Um, so if you run it like in different regions, different cloud providers, it all behaves the same. And keep in mind, it's still a process, so it's as fast as spawning a process. Okay, so is that enough? Um, no, so we've just looked at one single host, but with large business applications, we'll most likely have tens or even hundreds or thousands of hosts running that business application. Um, and so this is where we're coming to Kubernetes and I love that picture. So that's a container ship with thousands of containers. And that's actually what your business application will look like. Of course, this is calm C, um, but like also in rough C, it shouldn't lose its containers. Uh, it should stay afloat. And basically with a business, business application, um, you're most of the time you will be in rough C. So you need some means to control the containers, restart the containers, make sure containers run on the host dedicated for them. So if you have machine learning workload, you want to make sure those containers run on hosts that have GPUs. Um, Kubernetes, so a couple of years ago, there were multiple container orchestrators, um, but kind of the industry has emerged towards Kubernetes. So Kubernetes is a project um, originally started by Google, building on more than 10 years of experience running cloud native applications at Google and basically including most of the learnings that they had during that period of time. Okay, so with that, let's deep dive into Gardner, what it is and, and how it works. This is our mission statement, universal Kubernetes at scale. Um, this is a very short sentence. It used to be a lot longer, but it has a lot in it. Um, so with Gardner, we manage Kubernetes on all major YAS providers in all different regions and in private data center. And we do that homogeneously. So a Kubernetes cluster deployed on AWS will look exactly the same like in your own data center on OpenStack. Um, we manage thousands of clusters very efficiently for ourselves. So as I just said, we need five people to do that. And also for our users, our users don't need to manage their cluster, they just use it. So it's minimal TCO. Um, it's based on standard resources. So we're not using any YAS specific means. We're just using virtual machines, storage and network. We support multiple operating systems. So we support Garden Linux, which of course is our favorite, um, but we also do SUSE and Ubuntu. And it's all configurable. So Kubernetes has thousands of options that you can configure it. And we can configure those through Gardener. This said, we're clearly not boiling the ocean. Um, so SAP is part of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, which is a major industry development and innovation ecosystem and has built the Kubernetes community. Kubernetes today is probably the most active open source project on GitHub. And so all the major software suppliers, hardware suppliers, but also end user customers are part of that ecosystem. And that is what we call the cloud operating system. 
So we at SAP, we built Gardner to manage Kubernetes at large scale for enterprises. And we actually inherit all the qualities and features, both open source and commercial. And we have built a community around Gardner. Um, SAP is actually very active in the open source space. So we are part of the Cloud Native Foundation, um, Eclipse and Cloud Foundry, and we're a member of other organizations, but here we are Platinum or strategic members. Um, so we provide the Gardner project, uh, the Kuma project, Luigi and SAP machine, which is an open JDK provided by SAP. Um, Gardner is on GitHub. So all development that we do exclusively happens on GitHub. There are no hidden projects. It, it's all there. And by now, it has grown into a sizable uh, community project with contributors from, from many other organizations, both end users and even public cloud providers. So with Gardner, we have a multi-cluster operations UI to manage the clusters on all different infrastructures. So we have all the major cloud providers. We have OpenStack, we have MetalStack. Uh, we are partnering with VMware to bring Garden on VMware. We're partnering with Red Hat to bring Garden on OpenShift. And we've even um, run it on our own proprietary infrastructure, GMP. Um, Packet is one of the public cloud providers who offer a managed Kubernetes offering based on Gardner. So the lingua franca for Gardner is the shoot cluster resource. So internally in Gardner, everything is API based and we're using the Kubernetes means to define those APIs. And for a cluster that is the shoot kind cluster resource. So here we define a name, a project that the cluster is running in. Uh, we're defining a DNS name, my cluster project example.com where all the services will be visible. Uh, we define a hibernation schedule. Um, we define several options to configure Kubernetes. Um, we can define a maintenance window for our users when we automatically update Kubernetes or the operating system. We define a provider, which can be one out of the many we, we support. And we define worker pools. And those can be different worker pools, like for CPU optimized, memory optimized, or GPU workloads. Okay, and with that, I'll come to the demo. So we're starting with the Gardner dashboard. The Gardner dashboard is a UI to SAP internal clusters, um, and we're actually managing uh, a couple of thousand clusters in that infrastructure. So when I press login, I log in with my um, SAP single sign-on user, and I log on to the core project. The core project is actually the project for our team where we manage our clusters. Um, there is a message on top saying that uh, we don't support cores any longer because it has reached its end of life and we urge users to migrate away. So let's get rid of that message. Um, of those clusters here, we have two that are actually running and healthy. Um, and the rest of them is actually hibernated. That means all of its YAS resources um, have been stopped and they don't incur any YAS costs at the moment. Um, they can be woken up at any point in time um, and then can be used. Um, we support a couple of infrastructures here, AWS, OpenStack, Azure, GCP and Ali Cloud. But let's not change that project here. So for this demo, I have created my own project called Tekka demo and there are no clusters at the moment. So let's create one. Okay, so the infrastructure will be AWS. So let's give it a name, we'll just call it demo. Uh, we select the Kubernetes version from a wide variety down to 1.12. So let's go for the latest one. Um, it's an evaluation cluster. It's AWS infrastructure. Uh, we can define several worker pools. Um, so we can select the machine type from the YAS provider. 
which in this case is M5 large, that's okay. We uh, specify garden linux, which I'll introduce later in this presentation. Um, we support a variety of other operating systems, so namely there is uh, SUSE and Ubuntu, but we'll leave it at garden linux. Um, have a yeah, specific volume type for AWS, a volume size for the root volume, autoscaler settings, so that means when we create the cluster, one node is created, but if there's too much load, then Gardner will automatically spawn a second node. Um, there are some add-ons that we um, provide. One is the Kubernetes dashboard and one is the Nginx Ingress, but we don't configure either of them. Um, Gardner automatically updates the operating system and, and Kubernetes within a maintenance time window if selected. So yeah, keep safe, um, update both. And we define a hibernation schedule. So that means uh, on every weekday, the cluster will be hibernated at 5 p.m. to save cost. Okay, so we don't touch that here. Just have a quick look at the YAML file. So basically Gardner does everything via Kubernetes API. So we have a Kubernetes manifest called shoot that further specifies the properties of the cluster. And in fact, it's a lot more detailed than what we have in the UI. Okay, so let's leave it at that and create a cluster. And depending on the infrastructure that will take between like three minutes and 10 minutes, um, so we'll just fast forward. So now the cluster has been successfully created. Um, I get the message that it will self-terminate in seven days. This is the Kubernetes version. The worker groups I have configured, I created it uh, today. Um, it's an evaluation cluster. I have not configured any add-ons. It's AWS in region EU Central 1. Um, these are the network ranges of ports, nodes, and services. Um, I can hibernate the cluster manually. I can configure the maintenance schedule, um, and I can delete the cluster. Uh, on the right side, I can open a terminal into the cluster. Uh, I can download the cube config, so I can use it locally on the command line. Um, it's successfully being created and it's healthy. Also the components are healthy. Um, there is a Grafana dashboard with metrics for the cluster. And that will conclude the demo and I will now return to the presentation. So this was a glimpse on what we do with Gardner in production today. So let's go more into depths on how Gardner works and what Gardner makes different to other Kubernetes distributions. So let's start with looking at a classical Kubernetes setup. So you have some cloud native workloads, some business applications. Um, they're running on worker nodes um, in a container runtime. In some YAS account, there are multiple worker nodes. And we have a leader, which is running the Kubernetes control plane. And that basically is the brain of Kubernetes that is managing the workload. So there are multiple leaders. And that basically is a Kubernetes cluster that is used by administrators and that is serving business applications. So what's not optimal about that setup? So there are actually two things. Um, first, um, for being highly available, which of course we want to be. Um, we need three leader nodes. So most of our clusters currently are fairly small. So that means you're kind of wasting a lot of resources. You're paying for resources that you don't use. If the cluster gets very big, then you might have to manually add more nodes. And with Gardner, we don't want to do anything manual. Secondly, if you provide this as a service to your users, then your users might actually be able to reconfigure Kubernetes. And that makes it very hard to automatically manage it later on. And remember, for the resources, we're already running more than 3,000 clusters, and we expect to, to reach 10,000 next year. So that are a lot of resources that you miss. So this is not what we're doing here. But let's go back. So how is Gardner implemented? So let's look at the definition of Kubernetes. 
Kubernetes ist ein Open Source System for automating deployment, scaling and management of containerized applications. And as Kubernetes is software itself, we use Kubernetes to deploy, host and operate Kubernetes. We call that inception or cubeception. So it's recursive. So going back to our picture, you will have seen um, there appeared shoot cluster A on the right side. So what we do is we create another Kubernetes cluster that can be a classical Kubernetes cluster, but can also be one that is managed by Gardner, which we mostly do in our environments. Okay, so what we do is we actually take the control plane of the shoot cluster A and move it over to run in the seed cluster as a container, as a Kubernetes workload. And here Kubernetes takes care of scaling it out, scaling it in, and making sure if something fails to, to recreate everything. Uh, we are actually running many control planes in a seed cluster. Um, and by the way, we have lots of seed clusters for all those different environments across the globe. Okay, then going to the left side, we have the Gardener. The Gardener itself is also a Kubernetes application that is running in a Kubernetes cluster. So all this runs on the YAS environment. So we run it in the SAP data center. Uh, we run it in public cloud environments. We run it in other private environments. And even like they don't need to run on the same environment. So it's okay for one to run at SAP and one of, of on Azure talking to one on AWS. So we do everything with Kubernetes means with custom resource definitions, CIDs to manage everything, also the YAS resources. Um, there are some further or further means. So we have the horizontal and vertical pod autoscaler that scales the control plane components in case of higher load or, or lower load. And there are some custom services that we deploy also internally. Okay, so let's look at a quick animation on what Gardener does. So if something goes wrong, like, and that happens surprisingly often, so let's say a node goes away, then Gardener sees, ah, there should be three nodes, there are only two, let's recreate it. Um, then we have the cluster autoscaler, so if the load increases, Gardener adds a node, so things start to get healthy again. If the load decreases, Gardener will remove the node again, saving cost. Um, Gardner does automatic updates. So we've seen the maintenance window. Uh, so for example, here we have an update from version 1.18 to 1.19, but we also update the operating system. And some very cool feature that we introduced is hibernation. So that means for development clusters that are not needed, for example, during the night, uh, we can just shut them down. And that actually saves YAS resources and that has already saved us a very sizable amount of money over the last three years. If there is kind of a network outage between the Gardner and the shoot cluster environment, that usually does not matter because the workloads are unaffected. Okay, so let's talk about a couple of exciting projects that we're doing in the context of Gardner. So we have the Garden on Metal project we do that in cooperation with Finance Informatic Technology Service and Deutsche Telekom. And the first, they actually have a, a productive offering in the banking sector based on Gardner on Metal. So what's so revolutionary about that? Um, so basically we start with hardware and we can really run on any hardware, whether it's like x86, whether it's GPU or even ARM. Um, we basically take that and register that as Kubernetes resources or CRDs in the compute control plane. Next, we have the network and we really focused a lot on the network. So we have the open source Sonic operating system on the switches, the workloads in those switches that's all containerized and all the resources are managed through the network control plane, again, through Kubernetes. For storage, we use Ceph, 
And again, we manage all the CEF resources through Kubernetes resources in the storage control plane. And on top of that, we run the Kubernetes clusters like on any YAS environment uh, with some cloud native operating system like Garden Linux or SUSE uh, or Ubuntu. Okay, so then my favorite project is, is Garden Linux. Garden Linux is a hardened minimal operating system that serves as the foundation for Gardener and the Metal Stack. And we actually started that in February when the Corona restrictions kicked in here in Germany. It's based on Debian, um, but it's a very minimal Debian. And since that was not available before, we actually have a lot of interest in that um, because it is designed to run container workloads only. So it has nothing else in it that it doesn't need. And this makes it smaller and makes it more secure because it has fewer components that can have uh, vulnerabilities. It's immutable. So as I said initially, um, you don't need to install software. With Garden Linux, you cannot install software. You can only install software by deploying containers. And with all of that, we have a very minimal attack vector. And we're actually based on the latest Linux technologies, like a 5.4 long-term kernel which allows us to use like container D and Gvisor, Gvisor being a sandbox to increase the security of containers. Okay, so let's move on to Gardener for private clouds. So today you can actually use the Gardener community installer, Garden Setup, that is part of the GitHub Gardener project for private Gardener installations. And what's very important, Gardner will be the foundation for the planned managed private cloud offerings from SAP. And on through that, there is an option to run on the following platforms besides hyperscalers. So that's OpenStack, MetalStack that we're working on. And then we have a cooperation both with VMware and Red Hat to bring Gardner on VMware Cloud Foundation and OpenShift. So one of the projects is Gardener on VMware Cloud Foundation that I'm managing. Um, so we have VMware Cloud Foundation and we're using standard resources like virtual machines, network and storage from VMware Cloud Foundation, uh, which is vSphere, NSXT and vSun. Based on that, we have a base Kubernetes cluster that is brought by the environment and we're putting Gardner on it and the seed cluster. And from there, we're actually shooting the shoot clusters in that environment. And they're Gardner managed, they're homogeneous, their functionality is just the same as like if you deploy that on AWS uh, or Azure. In addition, we need resources that you need to have new data center. So we need an identity provider. We need S3 storage for backups. We need certificate management and we need a programmable DNS. And with that, I'm concluding my presentation with some summary and, and takeaways. Universal Kubernetes at scale Gardener. So we provide Gardener managed Kubernetes clusters on all major YAS providers and private data centers. It's very cost effective. It's very scalable, thousands, tens of thousands of clusters. It's extensible. So it's relatively straightforward to add additional cloud providers to Gardner. And it's 100% open source. Um, we're using upstream Kubernetes. So we're not changing anything there. It's vanilla upstream Kubernetes and we managed that homogeneously across all the YAS environments. And with that, I would like to conclude my presentation. Um, I hope I could give you some insights on what will be coming and how our industry is changing with regards to running and managing software. I would like to hint to some more information. So we have with DEF 269, we have a hands-on session for Gardner you're interested in, in that topic. 
and we're doing a partner session par 105, 105 with VMware. We're doing a deep dive on Gardner on VMware Cloud Foundation. There are also resources for Gardner, GitHub pages, mailing lists. Um, we have community meeting recordings on YouTube going back for years. Um, and there are links for the Garden Linux and Metal Stack pages. Continue your learning experience from Zap in 2020, your exclusive path to build and maintain SAP solution skills anytime, any place. Thank you for attending. Um, you can contact me for further topics and inquiries at dirk.mawinski at sap.com. Thank you.